Welcome to the Mind of Wedge YouTube channel. My name is Wedge, and I've been building and flying high power rockets for years now. This year, though, I want to get my level three certification, and in preparation for doing that, I'm going to be doing a few high performance level two builds. In this video, I'm breaking down how I built this 54 millimeter minimum diameter fiberglass rocket. So let's get into the build. To start this build off, I chose 1 8 inch G10 fiberglass for the fins. I created a design in Open Rocket that got the stability margin to where I liked it, and then I cut the fins out and beveled the leading edge with the belt sander until they were all as symmetrical as I could get them. Then I 3D printed a fin jig to hold the fins perfectly straight while the root edge cured overnight. The next day, I pulled the jig off the fins and started the sanding prep for the fillets. After sanding, I wiped the whole fin area with acetone to remove any dust or residue. I masked off the areas where the fillets would go and then mixed up some epoxy and pulled the fillets. Once the fillets were cured, I again sanded the whole fin area and filled any low spots. The last step is one final sanding of the entire area to prepare for the composite layup. I first used some newspaper to make templates for cutting the fiberglass cloth. For this build, I used two layers of seven ounce cloth with each layer at a 45 degree angle to each other to get maximum strength out of the weave. I mixed up some US Composite 635 epoxy with the medium hardener, which gives you about one and a half to two hours of working time before it really starts to cure. I then wetted out the whole fin area where the fiberglass would go, and I applied the first layer, making sure to get the glass fully seated into the fillets. Once the cloth is laid down, it's pretty easy to move it around and adjust it so it's even on all the edges. Once I was happy with the first layer, I repeated the process for the second fiberglass layer, making sure not to trap any air bubbles between the layers. Once it's all laid down and there are no air bubbles, I applied the last layer, which is a peel ply. And the peel ply serves two purposes. One, it soaks up any excess epoxy. And two, once it's removed after curing, it leaves a smooth flat finish. The last step in the composite layup was to mix up some epoxy with a thickener in it to fill any pinholes or low spots and then sand some more. I like to hit the area that I'm working on with a coat of primer first to reveal all the areas that I missed and trust me, there are always areas that you missed. And moving on to the avionics. For the avionics bay on this build, I started out by assembling the flight computer and GPS system. This is the Quasar from Egg Timer Rocketry. It is a flight computer kit that you solder yourself with three outputs and a GPS transmitter all in one package. It has a main channel, a drogue channel, and then a third auxiliary channel that can be configured to light a second stage or air starts, or in my case, can be used as a backup drogue charge. During this time, I also built a handheld GPS receiver. Both the Quasar and the GPS receiver are powered by a 7.4 volt two cell LiPo. I 3D printed a sled to mount all the electronics and then test fit everything in the coupler to make sure all the components fit comfortably. And all of this is great and fun, but none of it matters if the rocket doesn't come back to the surface of the earth slow and altogether. So let's talk about recovery. The recovery in this rocket was quite simple and standard for this build using head end dual deploy. The upper section holds a 24 inch main chute and the lower section holds a high speed drogue parachute. With limited space in both of these sections, it was essential to pack the chutes as tight and as neat as I could get them. The lower section, as you can see here, is held together by friction fit. And then the upper section has two holes, one right here and the other on this side for shear pins. I used two 256 shear pins to hold the nose cone on. And you can see it's a head end dual deploy where the nose cone just fits right on top of the coupler there. And with this being a minimum diameter rocket, I needed a way to anchor the shock cord to the booster. So to solve this, I built an acorn point and you can see it's attached right here in this screw hole and this screw hole. There's a bit of coupler section, maybe about two inches long in here. And then at the top, there's two uh, 1 8 inch G10 bulk plates that are glued into that coupler with an eye bolt on them. And that provides me a hard point to mount the shock cord to in the booster to keep it all together. And so with the fins done, the shock cord mounted, all the electronics, Everything checks out with balance and CG. I 3D printed some conformal rail guides for this build just because I didn't want to have to screw anything through. So these are printed out of PLA plus and they just are epoxied on. And uh, for motor retention, 
I used the Giant Leap Rocketry Slimline Retainer because I'm not really worried about aerodynamics with this build. I kind of just wanted to more start getting my foot into the door with high performance minimum diameter flights. So the, the Slimline Retainer offers me just positive motor retention. It's very simple and it's a cheap and easy solution rather than having to glue in a bulkhead and, and get a forward closure that's threaded and all that kind of stuff. So I kept it real simple, not too worried about aerodynamics or anything. But with the whole, with the whole rocket done now, um, let's head out to the desert and fly it. In five, four, three, two, one. Just went about 6,000 feet or 5,000 feet on a J350 and it came down not too far. We didn't really need GPS, but the egg timer Quasar GPS system worked pretty good it lost lock on the boost and then got it back right before the apogee deployment and then had lock all the way down keeping the alt or altitude updating and um when it landed it lets you know that it's on the ground and then updates you with a gps um packet every 30 seconds or so so i see it out there I see the pink shot cord. Um, the only thing I don't see is my drogue. I think it's still in the body. So it came down drogueless, which I might just take the drogue out then because it seems to have worked fine. So there's the nose, there's the eBay, there's the booster. Let's all right, back from the launch, the 54 millimeter minimum diameter rocket flew great for its first flight. The test flight was on an Aerotech J350. It flew to right around 6,800 feet, hitting just about Mach 0.87. The only thing that wasn't totally perfect about the flight was that the drogue chute got pushed either into the upper airframe too much or it was packed too tight. Um, it, and it didn't come out at Apogee. It came down drogueless essentially, which wasn't a problem. Um, it actually landed fairly close to the pad, about 300 yards away. So from 7,000 feet or around 7,000 feet, not that far of a landing. Everything about the rocket was super solid, very locked in. The fins, I took a lot of time to make sure they were very symmetrical and aligned perfectly straight down the body too. Also a new thing for me was using um, a GPS system in a rocket. And then also uh, I've never used the egg timer GPS system. So I used the Quasar in this, and uh, this is the handheld LCD receiver, and it also performed fantastic. Uh, it lost lock as expected, kind of on the boost, and then before Apogee, I got lock back, and then had lock all the way down, sending packets throughout the descent, um, right to the landing site, and then at, after it landed, it just continuously sent me that packet of where it landed, so I knew the exact GPS coordinates. You can see the rocket did get just a little bit toasted on the back, but that's just motor residue. That's not actually burned. And I think the next flights I want to do some actual 54 millimeter motors. Maybe I have a J275, I have a J460, which 460 puts it above Mach or right around Mach 1.1. Um, I kind of wanted the next flight, I want to push it past Mach a little bit. So either that or any of the 54 1280 loads, those push it up towards Mach 1.5. The 54 1706 loads push it towards like a K1103, we'll put it at like Mach 1.8. So I think that would be a fun flight to do as well. Also, I think I'm, I'm a big fan of the Quasar. This isn't dual deployed and dual redundant electronics. So it's just one flight computer in here, it's the Quasar. But what I like about it is that it has an auxiliary channel that you can program into either uh, a backup main, a backup drogue, you can light a second stage with it, you can do a bunch of stuff with it. I just have it running as a backup drogue, just to make sure that it separates at Apogee and doesn't come in ballistic. But I have it set up for a second after Apogee to, to fire that and everything fired and it worked great. One thing I noticed as well was definitely there's a difference between a completely fiberglass rocket and some of my other uh, cardboard rockets. This thing, it's, it's just very solid. Um, you can tell when it hits the ground, it's solid. You can tell when it launches, it's solid. Nothing is flexing. It's very strong, especially the tip to tip uh, I did on the fins. They're very stout. And I, anything high performance, I think I'll be doing tip to tip just because of the, the stiffness it gives the fins. 
it's uh it's unbeatable and i don't really i'm not concerned about these fins breaking off even if it came in without a drogue i really am not concerned about the fins uh being too damaged unless it hit like a rock or something but it's a very very solid build and i'm excited to fly it on some bigger uh, 54 millimeter motors and if you've made it this far in the video thank you for watching i appreciate it and i'll be posting some more rocketry related content here shortly